Um, I do, if you don't mind, I did want to mention um, I made a mistake in um, thinking that this was actually just a count when I was looking at the agenda, just a council uh, meeting. So there's some items on here that really um, you can definitely be part of the conversation if we do continue it. But I thought that we'll take item item number one out of sequence, if you don't mind, and actually put that down below um, as item number five, since there is a gap between four and six. <laughs> Um, I think that we knew that was going to happen. <laughs> so, if you guys don't mind, we'll just go ahead and make that administrative uh, change. So, uh, synergy sometimes um, is humorous. That way, we can just uh, go ahead and jump into the joint conversation that we want to share, which is uh, between the town council and the school. Um, so, th there's the discussion and a review on the school budget. And um, so, just as an introduction, I'll be honest, this is my first time going through this in the number of years that I've done this in which we've had a joint session, so I don't really know where to take it, so I'm kind of hoping that we all contribute to where we want the conversation to go. Um, this, this is just, and I'll be honest, in the past it's been a very linear approach. Town Council gets the school board's uh, recommendations, there's the first reading, there's the public hearing, um, there's the second reading, and that's when, boom, everything comes down and the changes are made, and so there wasn't a whole lot of dialogue in my tenure right before. So. This is new to me, so I appreciate everyone's help in running the meeting today, sure. if you don't mind. So with that, um, yeah, if George and I talk talked a, a bit about what we could accomplish tonight, there's right. a number of areas I think the school uh, staff and, and finance committee would like to update uh, the town finance committee on, would, yep. and, and perhaps uh, I might suggest uh, you know, that's going to take your conversation perhaps in a number of different ways. Excellent. But, um, I think that yep. might be a good place to start, George. Yeah, I, I think... Um, if you uh, agree to this, I'd like to start with um, some, some uh, questions that have come from the public, basically, and I, I thought that the uh, forum was a good forum, and I, I thought it was uh, reasonable, but there seem to be some uh, big beliefs um, and or big questions out there, and um, so we went into um, analysis mode and have some uh, information to share with you. I'll share with you the, these quick little um, three pages that I have, and uh, Kate has some backup material that she will also provide for you so that you can, um, at your leisure, um, spend some time taking a look at it in the same way that we did. So let me give these to you guys. Thank you. Mr. George is distributing those. Um, I suggested to have this backup to the extent that you're all interested in knowing that some of the details, yep. but not taking time tonight to go through that uh, unless you think it's productive use. Um, the backup? Right. Yeah, we'll, we can get, we'll have it. But yeah, we'll give it to you this evening, good. but uh, I don't know if we need to dive you know, all the way into the weeds tonight. This is intended yeah. just to be kind of no, a yeah. check in. Sure. I figured there may be a few things that we'd want to look at, but really right. a lot of this is very mm -hmm. background stuff that's mm -hmm. come up in, in questions as we've gone along. Good. Okay, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through this uh, quickly. You can stop me um, if you have a question. But I think there are three beliefs, if you will, um, and I want to add some data to this. Um, first belief, uh, state reported per pupil costs are not accurately reflecting actual school expenses as some of the expenses are carried by the town. Um, Tom and I got together and said, you know what, it would be worthwhile for us to sort of make some assumptions and run these numbers um, that would reasonably um, uh, neutralize that concern. And uh, so there are two areas of cost that were identified by the town and the school uh, that may skew per pupil expenditure comparisons. Um, it is the uh, central office uh, arrangement that we have in terms of the school central office and also grounds maintenance and facility scheduling. So what we did was um, we looked at, or Tom looked at, and did a nice analysis in terms of office space, $17 per square foot, 3,000 square foot of which we have, ends up with a hefty $51,000 cost. So it is, it is a, um, it's an estimate that is, that is high, but we said, okay, let's take that number, 51,000. Grounds maintenance facility scheduling at 70% of the cost totals, uh, again, high. Um, estimate there, but totals uh, $368,000. So there's a cost, let's presume or assume that there's a cost advantage of $419,000 that would end up in, uh, being $135 per pupil. 
So we allocated the $135 per pupil expense type, 17 bucks added to the school and system administration, 118 bucks, which is the balance of the $135 added to transportation and facilities. Um, and basically, um, you will notice with uh, Kate's, uh, Kate's item here, these were only expenses that were looked at, not revenues. Is that correct? As I understand, this, this statistic only concerns itself with expenses. This is the uh, expenditure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But which doesn't take into account, I mean, the net impact would obviously zero out the income you would pick up if you charged community services to rent for the daycare, or rent for the gym, or rent for the ball field. That is not taken into account. N nor, is the in nor is the income that community services generates through the rental of that space either, right? The, for the fields and right. Like that. See, it right. goes on their side. Right, exactly. Right, right. See? right. It, so, but it just so happens that these numbers just deal with cost. Right, right. So, but, right. but there, there no is. No district takes into consideration revenue and the per pupil cost, right? I, I guess I should. I, I don't know exactly the methodology, but I think the way we treat it is, is, is arguably the most conservative way to look at it. And that's okay. my intent, right? Mm -hmm. Just to try to... Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah I, I, I'm not questioning. I just want to make sure I understand what the... Conservative with large numbers. estimates, basically. We're yeah. being conservative with, with right. very yeah. large estimates. Right. It's not likely this impactful to our per, per pupil advantage. Um, so you can see that there's, uh, in the yellow, you have, as reported, um, by the DOE and then adjusted to include the shared services piece. And there's really no change that happens in terms of our positioning. And um, the only thing that you're seeing um, in terms of the, the extra green line is just on these first three areas, which is total per pupil, mm -hmm. school and system administration, where we allocated some money, and transportation and facilities, where we allocated the balance. And I do think that um, it is also making an assumption that other school districts do not have the same type of advantage. Um, and we can look just over the line in Cape Elizabeth, a place that I know pretty well, um, having served on the board there and raised my three children there. And in fact, we do know that they basically have the same um, advantages that Scarborough does in terms of office space and, um, and uh, the way that uh, things work in terms of their, their grounds and maintenance and so on. So, so, so we really wanted to put that piece to rest. So here are the new numbers. Um, the second belief Just is that if I could, I've committed, and I'm sure George will join me in this, to doing a detailed analysis so we can speak with great, a greater degree of certainty than I'm... Absolutely. Yep. But, we, but we felt that that would be, a, that's a reasonable adjustment to make and, uh, and to, and we ran it, and there are the results. Second belief is that school spending is out of control. Um, and then it's the cause of tax increases. Um, uh, Kate will be handing out, um, while I'm uh, reviewing this with you, um, we went back 20 years and basically Scarborough has had the lowest per pupil cost, uh, lower than the local cohort, which is that group that we compare ourselves to, and lower than the state average for the last 20 years. And it's not just lower, it is significantly lower. So much so that during those 20 years, had Scarborough invested at the state average, the schools would have received an additional investment, again, over 20 years, of more than $46 million, or an average of $2.3 million each year for every year during that period. That's how much lower we are than the state average. For the 1994-2014 period, had we invested at the local cohort average, not the highest, but at the, at the, at the uh, average of per pupil cost with the cohort group, the schools would have received an additional investment of more than $84 million, or an average of $4.4 million each year, every year, for those 20, 20 years, okay? Um, we wanted to, you know, when we, in education, when we think about a, a student's progress, we try to look at as, as many data points as possible. So in triangulating the data, what we did was we went out to the National Center for Educational Statistics, which is um, a, a branch of the U.S. Department of Education, and what they will do is 
is um, they have all of the, the school districts and they will provide a matched national cohort, which they did. They matched us with 17 other like districts. And the good, the good data point on here was that MSAD 51, which is Cumberland North Yarmouth showed up. That's also one of our cohort districts. Um, and when we were compared with that cohort, again, for not just Maine, but outside of Maine, um, we were um, spending less than the average of that ma matched cohort. Again, it's only for a one-year period. The data, so the data is not like that exciting, but it does provide a point of triangulated data to say, you know what, even if we look on a national level, it's likely um, we, we are still we are still spending in a way that should blow up this belief that school spending is out of control. And then lastly, I think it's a, um, uh, the, the focus really is taking a look at how much state subsidy has decreased, and it's really been the loss of non-tax revenues uh, that has really um, impacted the, the, the budget. And it's the town budget, but it is the loss of non-tax revenues to the schools. And then the last, so and what Kate handed out to you is the 20-year um, study and all of the data and what was the other, and also the yeah. NCES. Segment, yeah. And so you got the NCES piece. And then the last piece, and I, I wanted to just do this quickly, school spending growth should be limited um, to the increase in cost of living as defined by uh, an accepted measure such as CPI. We told you what CPI is, um, and basically I, I think that no one uh, disagrees that it would be great to have some kind of um, metric that would that would really indicate for us some predictability, some ability to look in the next couple of years and really see what is appropriate um, and adequate uh, growth in a school budget. Um, and I think that um, so we so this the school as well and and uh, my team and I are are looking for that measure. Uh, CPI is not that measure. Uh, it is not appropriate to benchmark um, budget growth um, uh, using CPI for schools or other human resource intensive non-revenue generating organizations. I do think that while there are business models that work well in our schools, um, we are not a business. Uh, we're just not a business. So we've gone through and done an analysis of the expenditure of growth from 94 to uh, 2014. We looked at the 10 local cohort districts, we looked across the state and state average growth, and we looked at Scarborough. And, and basically, if you look at that, the, there, is a, there is a parameter, and the parameter is between about 4.4% 4 and 5%, which is really sort of annual average targeted growth. And it's over 20 year, years. So it basically has taken all of the ups and downs in there and smoothed them out and it ends up in that range. Um, the thing to know is that because of the difference in our spending versus the cohort and even versus the state average, other districts have reduced their rate of expenditure during that tough time, but they didn't necessarily need to um, uh, to dig into their programs. They, they basically maintained a higher per pupil investment during that time and when things got tough, they stepped back on the increases that they were making, but them step, stepping back versus us stepping back were two different scenarios. We were cutting into bone, they were cutting um, and trimming some of the fat and, and sort of r removing some of, some of the things that they had. When we slashed and burned um, our foreign language program, they said, let's not um, have German this year. And, and so it's, the, the contrast um, is, um, is fairly stark in terms of the investments made and the, uh, the weathering of the storm. Is that all that we have to share in terms of this piece? Yeah, because the second handout really kind of speaks to both of those. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, just, just a quick question. I mean, if I'm looking, if I'm looking at this, the large handout we gave correctly, yep. and, I, and I appreciate there's, there's a 20 year history here, um, but if I do look at the last three or four years, which, yep. it, which is I think where what the taxpayers are feeling, because that's, they don't remember what they paid in taxes 20 years ago. They do remember that it, it does appear that 
in the last couple of years, we are above the groups that you have selected here. So is there something unusual in the last three or four years that's causing well, I pretty think, significant I think in the last three or four years, we have, instead of slicing, we have started to add some more incremental yeah. investments. And I think that, um, and again, we, because of, because of the, um, the, the critical impact that the cuts had on the programs, we've been trying to restore and rebuild. And so um, it is, it's really, um, it, it, you know, it, it's really just been of the recent time that we've been uh, sort of getting back on par. If you look at, Kate has a nice little graphic that we've scared you um, from this, I'll have to, I'll, I'll get this evening, but it, it really just looks at the, the trend over over 20 years, and, and you do see us beginning to come back up, but that still doesn't account for the spending that was being invested in the at the state level, at the, the state average, and the spending that was being <coughs> invested in the cohort group, the average spending there. Um, and, and sort of the nice solid foundation that, that they built that we've not built yeah. here. No, but I, I think this is, I mean, I, I understand the, the broad perspective. Yep. But, but I guess what I'm just zeroing in on is at least what I'm hearing from a lot of constituents is, is some type of relief valve. I mean, it, it, it really felt some pressure the last couple of years. This sort of indicates in the last couple of years that, that you've been investing, as you suggested. Right. But I'm just, I'm just trying to point out there is some sensitivity. They don't remember 20 years ago. They do remember right. last year, this year. Well, and I think the benefit and the, and the uh, positive uh, contribution of that 20-year analysis is really to try to establish the metric that seems to be fairly reliable between a 4.4 and 5 plus percent. And as you know, our expenditures right now, as they said, and we still have some other things to talk about, uh, is that um, uh, the school's expenditure level is at 5.15 percent right now. I think uh, I should mention that it's noted on here, but there's a lot of fine print on all those big pieces of paper, that this is expenditures, not budget. Mm -hmm. So if you've, mm -hmm. you've seen some of our other charts showing the trajectory of the increase in budget or you know, increase, flat decrease, what have you, um, this is a different set of numbers. It's a different set of data, but I think we were aiming for that sort of what's the appropriate progression over time. And, um, you know, Bill and I talked many weeks ago about trying to dig back a little bit deeper so that we were able to smooth out some of those bumps and ups and downs and see what, uh, what it looks like in the long term. I, I think also, I mean, uh, again, it's just the 20-year the piece, um, regardless of what the trend has been, and this is another, this is a trend for Scarborough to, to be a little uh, a little bit uh, investing a little bit more in the, in the schools, but for the previous years, anyone who's been here during that period of time, um, uh, and and we were not investing at the level of the cohort or at the state average, there was um, a fairly significant savings that was also happening. Mm. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of information to absorb. Yeah. But I mean, I I thought for a long time that that the problem was largely the loss of state funding. Uh, that towns generally had been asked to uh, bear the burden of the state trying to balance their budgets on the backs of municipalities. And so I, I think that the, where people should be directing their criticism is the people we're sending to uh, Augusta. <clears throat> and that really is Amen. That uh, if if we thought we were running our schools, Maine's a, not a rich state. I mean, it has no mentality of of uh, uh, excessive spending uh, at the local level. Uh, most of these towns uh, have to dig deep for this. So it, 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 I'm glad to see this. It, it does reinforce that, but I. I'd want to look at it closer. The one specific question I had was in this 20-year study, the second page, far right-hand column, is, is, am I correct that the average of the 10 cohorts in green is, is a 4.35% increase over that 20-year period? The and, average annual change. And, and the state average was 4.5, 4.5. 
and the average for Scarborough was 4.96. Right. And that's why you see on the chart that you don't have, <laughs> Scarborough line begins to so grow a little bit closer right. to that Not, state average. I mean, it gets closer to, it's still far apart from the cohort average, um, but it's getting, um, it is getting closer to the, oh, you yeah. have did sure. I didn't produce this, so I should just speak to it. No. Do you want to just show that? We could pass it around. I'm sorry, I didn't know how to copy it. That's, uh, we've seen it, so. I'll get back. Oh, okay. Scarborough shown in green. I think the point is Scarborough's in the out years, the recent years, is catching up. It's, it's touching that. Sure. Yeah. Line. That's to your point, Peter. Right, that's right. Yeah. But that unfortunately, that's what people are feeling. So that's that's, yeah. that's the only reason I mention it. That's well, and remember that this is only the expenditure side, so you have that offset with whatever's happening on the revenue side as well. Unfortunately, it's not a pretty picture. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it just compounds yeah. the. But you're so right. It's what have you done for me lately? It's what. Huh. It's what is in, in, in people's consciousness is the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess and the only thing I'll add, and Bill, and I, I agree with you about state funding and stuff. Unfortunately, there is no free lunch, so it's one pocket or the other. And unfortunately, though, I think what we're faced with is I'm not sure that the Augusta scenario is going to change. So what does that mean for us and how do we plan? And right. How do you defend against, you know, the constant loss of revenue? Well, I know, but, it, but it's, it's outrageous. It's totally mm -hmm. outrageous that, that they would be doing that. Uh, well, the I, municipalities. But, but it creates a challenge for us as a community about how we're going to manage that. So I think that's what we're all at the table but to I talk think about. There's, there's a flip side to that that's a positive, and Tom maybe could speak to this better than I could, of course, but one of the reasons that we were told by the state when we inquired about why we continue to lose the revenue that we lose is because of our valuation has stayed the same or improved right. relative to the communities around us. So right. we're, 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 we're losing on the, on the educational side of things, but the town as a whole is prospering. So, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the consequence of maintaining those property values in lean economic times that we're seeing here. It's not a magic you know, one funding formula that we're, that nobody knows what goes in or comes out. There is a method to the madness. We may not agree with the method, yeah. the methodology, but mm -hmm. all things being equal in the state, that is supposed to be the great equalizing factor. But, but the problem that it creates in the short term is, I think in Scarborough now, especially some of the families that have been here, you know, coastal properties or whatever, they're property rich. That valuation in their properties in their property, but they're cash poor. The only way they can get that valuation is they have to sell. But for and years, that's, yeah. And that, that's just, I mean, that's just a, that's right. a challenge. But for years and years, that valuation, even when the market was down, never reduced. It stayed the same. So for the last 10 plus years, I mean, I can speak to that in my own home. Yeah. You know, and, and then, mm -hmm. you know, and, I, and I guess the point, the point isn't, the, I don't want the argument to be that it's, it's not about just expenditures on the school side of things. I guess that's the takeaway piece is that we are losing revenue not because of anything we're doing wrong, but we're doing we're losing it because of our success. Yeah, right. Because of our success as town and holding our valuation. Yeah, and that's the explanation. Right. I was just going to say, this data is, uh, is really the start of a longer range conversation of, around sustainability and mm -hmm. how we're going to function going forward because mm -hmm. a lot of these factors are not going to change. Well, given the uncertainty of the environment that we're going into, and I'm not even talking about this fiscal year, I mean, we already know next year is going to be even more challenging. I mean, if, uh, you know, revenue sharing is uh, eliminated, we already know the county government is going to be tacked on with a four and a half million dollar bill that's going to be a 13 percent increase for the town, let alone um, looking at the averages we're probably going to see either a flattening of what we're getting in GPA or maybe a slight reduction. Yeah. So it's going to be further reduction of revenue sources coming from the state. What's the reason for the county going up so much? Um, it's the governor's proposal regarding uh, GL expenses that will be shifted from the state onto the county. Okay. We'll get a proportional The county jail, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A proportional share would be something that About 13 percent and close to 13. Okay. So this was, this was just an effort to really take what we heard um, or what we've been hearing and, uh, and try to add some uh, facts to it, try, try, to, um, uh, try to jump in and, and do something about the per pupil costs um, so that it, it is seen as being reliable and it is seen as being fairly accurate, um, that in fact that things spending is not out of control and that it is not the schools that are the, uh, the cause of the tax increases and that um, CPI is probably not a good metric uh, to be using because it's not connected.
at all to mm -hmm. what the reality is or has been. Can we, as a joint, can we put that on our agenda for work going forward? What is the metric we're all comfortable benchmarking with? I think we should have some benchmarks. Yeah, I, I mean, if yeah. it's not CPI, then let's have a conversation about what it is, because mm -hmm. I think it's important to agree on a benchmark. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then be able to gauge ourselves against that benchmark to say how we're doing. So okay. if it's not CPI, then let's have, let's just continuing work with this group, find out. Yeah, to my well, surprise, we did some research. I, I thought there would be somewhere a published national indicator of credibility. I couldn't find one. Uh, no, I didn't do an exhaustive search. I found a lot of academic work, you know, from tenor. Mm -hmm. 15 years yeah, ago, it's very old stuff. It talked about the, the general ideas, but uh, there's no published statistic that we can look to. So okay. it, I think it, it would be a great point to get to that we can all have some understanding about that. I, I just wanted to add um, first, thank you. This is awesome, awesome, awesome data. Um, I'm actually surprised in some way, only because if I look at the data, when I look at, um, although I don't really like comparing us to another community, but if we look at the green line on page two, which is the lag behind the cohort average, mm -hmm. if you look at the time frame between 97 and 07, you'll see a time, you'll see a period, a 10-year period of significant deterioration. And between 07 and today, you've seen a significant reinvestment. Some of it probably is obviously a recapture, if I'm looking at the data correctly. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I don't understand is that our current enrollment is actually, even though we're in a period of reinvestment, Current enrollment is actually decreasing and actually doesn't compare as low in 13, 14. I think it's 01, I might go, 01, 02. So to me, it would think, I would think that there would be, if there was a reinvestment in education, that we'd have, our enrollment would go up. I mean, I know there's so many different uh, socioeconomic reasons and demographic, you know, people move. And what, I, what I'd like to do, and I thought, I thought about looking at this, there's, there's no, I mean, obviously we can't do an exit survey of why people leave town. We could, but mm. no one's going to fill it out. We can't really survey people as why they choose one community over the other, unless we bring in some professionals. And I thought maybe we get some, some local real estate brokers in here and start asking them, what are the questions that they're getting? When people are looking at it, where they're evaluating communities, what are, what are some of the things that they're hearing of reasons why people are choosing to live longer? I mean, we kind of all in our heads really kind of know what they are, I think. But to, to me, I'd like to have somebody speak to that outside of the, you know, that's, that's not in the weeds of it, so to speak. Because it is perception. There's a lot yeah. of perception out there. Well, the reason why I kind of point that out is that there was one question that I received by email after the forum that hasn't been answered to a gentleman. And the question was, um, it, may, it might have been a, 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 a woman, I can't remember, I'm, I apologize, it's been a busy week. Um, and it was about why don't we have incentives to have more 55 plus mm -hmm. older communities, you know, like the uh, age and, or the deed restricted type of communities. Mm -hmm. Is that consistent with when our ordinances changed um, and really started? It's not that we don't prohibit them, they're allowed in many, many zones. It's, I think the questioner was wondering if we could incentivize it. Right. Now. And I think the real part of the question had to do with an acknowledgement that they don't have kids for the schools. They oh, right. provide good value, all of those sorts of things. And I think that's a valid point. It's something maybe we can have long-range planning yeah. committee look at. So keep in mind is that it doesn't matter um, what the citizen's <coughs> expectation is, that every citizen that moves into the community, regardless of age, has a demand on the community. If you're 55 and older, depending upon how far over 55 you are, there's you know, uh, probably more EMS type of uh, calls and police uh, fire calls relating to that. There's a balance in that. So I would imagine any healthy community has got a good balance of of all of the of the different demographics. If you skew to one side or the other, you know, your your costs tend to shift accordingly. I mean, if we were a, a young town with only parents and school children, then you know, our, our our I would imagine our costs would be a lot different. Yeah, this is a, just a working theory, but I suspect there's a lot of houses. Uh, in Scarborough, they're likely to turn over sometime in the next five to seven years. Folks that uh, I think of entire neighborhoods where I know a lot of my son's friends, uh, the parents are empty nest now. And that house, you know, used to have two or three kids in the school. Right. Uh, at some point in the near future, I suspect they'll be moving to another place, and I suspect there'll be a family that moves it behind them. So there'll be probably some rebound. Because those, pop those school age population. Trends seem to just biologic. If you look around the county and see the general activity, I don't think we're 
my hunch is that it's not going to be continually that it's going to start to grow. But I think that does speak to the to the what's drawing people to the community question of what you know what what are some of the major factors that cause people to move here? If, if you are um, you know a young family or a middle management kind of family, and schools are going to play a, a key factor in it's a choosing available, your, uh, affordable housing. Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's all part of the picture. I mean, I guess I guess the, my point is. is trying to look at the schools more as an asset than, than the perceived liability that it is. Mm -hmm. I believe one of the council's goals is to create some, some form of benchmarking um, as well as I would think that it would also include some type of survey um, you know, of our existing um, citizens. Guarantee we won't be able to recapture those who've already left, but it sets up at least a mechanism so that we can continue to monitor. When, when you were talking, I'm sorry, Sean. Yeah. When you were talking about the enrollment, yeah. what years were you comparing? So I said, um, if you look at the actual enrollment, I think today it's 3137. The last time it was that low was in 2001, which was okay. 3135. There was a slight increase in the, for the last three years. It's been a decrease, okay. oh, which tells me that the average, because the, the state takes a three-year average in the calculation. So if you're taking out your highest number in the three-year period. I'm not sure where we are today. I think we're about even, aren't we? No, increase of 10. Oh, increase of 10. So that helps, at least. That yeah, helps it's kind of shifting up again. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the, I thought Christine was going to maybe mention this. She's the chair of the Long Range Facilities uh, Planning Committee. But we've, um, we've charged the, the uh, planning decisions, which is the one that, uh, the agency that provides us with the demographic data that we need to really dig in and, and, and help us um, with some rely valid and reliable um, uh, projections in terms of student enrollment because it's, it's key to, to um, some of the plans that we have. As Tom pointed out, that was some of our conversation about some of the neighborhoods that yeah. are mm -hmm. turning over yeah. and in even my own where, you know, several places have just gone up for sale in the last mm -hmm. few weeks and it's, it's mm -hmm. people who don't need four bedroom homes mm -hmm. and three bathrooms and a two and a half car, you know, don't want to have to upkeep the grass, and they don't want to have to upkeep the everything, you know. Mm -hmm. So if you guys don't, if you don't mind, I want to ask Jean Marie Catering who's trying to, what's the average uh, length of a? <laughs> well, if you don't, that's fine. No, uh, do you know what the average sale, like um, from the point at which a house goes on the market in Scarborough, what is the average? I don't. It depends on yeah. it the does. price range and whatever. Yeah. Things right now are moving pretty quickly. Yeah. Because there's a lack of inventory. Yeah. Um, as far as white people want to move to Scarborough, I hate to tell you, but over the weekend, I'm moving about five or six more kids in the school. Full disclosure, full disclosure. But anyway, um, Mr. Hamlin's going to shoot. Anyway, um, people move to Scarborough, they, they, they all the time talk about school systems. They move here because they want the school system, they want to be close to Portland. I have some parents who actually commute to the Boston area, because uh, it's easy to get to Boston from here too, or the Portsmouth area. Uh, Scarborough just has a good reputation. There are some really good builders in town that build some nice housing. I will tell you, in case you didn't know, there's a lot of land still up there. It's going to be developed eventually. Yeah. The market's going on with a lack of inventory. The builders are looking hard right now. And Scarborough's going to be one of those places that they're looking at. Mm -hmm. So, there you go. My chance to get on the soapbox, Charles Kogan, the state economist, before he left, his departing comment was, communities, if they wish to grow and truly want to be prosperous, they need to look at their growth management ordinances that were enacted 15 years ago because they're archaic now and they need to be revisited. And if I that's okay. <laughs> We're used to it. At least this side. Because I know back in the day, we had the taxis on new construction. Um, I don't know if they dedicated or not dedicated. Uh, most most dedicated. are all de dedicated. There's okay. a school of taxi. Okay. I know the builders don't like to hear that. Mm -hmm. uh, my fellow rooms are family, but hey, it's something to look at. Does that go up to each yes. number of years? By, uh, <coughs> Uh, CPI sort of number. Yeah. It would be, be good to hear from uh, Dan Bacon uh, and long-range planning yeah. on what, you know, this idea that 
there's some antiquated nature to to our development limitations and rules of made in the last 10 or 15 years. It'd be interesting to, to see. I mean, clearly planners are all about let's avoid sprawl. Let's have you know large densities near the urban center. Well, and the downside to even my own suggestion that we follow Charles Pogan is that you're going to then, because of the square distance and the total, you know, area of Scarborough, you're talking about kids that will either need another school system or not, not another system, but another school in another part of town, or they're going to be driving long ranges to be able to get to the existing yeah. schools. Yeah. Um, um, I did want to mention, if, it, if it's, I think it's consistent with what Christine said, we do have um, a table that was provided to us on the council side regarding the impact fees that if you want to see historical, what has been collected over time and total the since school impact fees. The school impact fees, because I'd ask that, so we do have it if you want it. Can you, yeah, could yeah. you yeah. email that? I'd we, like to see we, what. We looked at it last week. Maybe it's, it's not maybe a lot of money, but it's, uh, it provides some perspective on, <laughs> I think it was about three and a half, four million dollars that yeah. has been collected yeah. in the yeah. 10 year period. Town Council would benefit from getting yeah. a little primer, yeah. a little it, education on this. Perhaps the last piece on this whole growth management, um, there was something called a growth and services report that was mm -hmm. the seminal report that, that really gave rise to these growth management ordinances. And as I recall, the, the report essentially said that every new house was built uh, cost the town $1,400 when you factor in all the services to provide to those, that new home. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was a big motivating factor to putting in the growth control ordinance and imposing a lot of the impact fees. Is that sort of a startup cost kind of thing to it's, connect? It's really the cost to educate. It's forward. really it's really education expenses the single biggest piece of that. So that would become an annual. No, it's a one time fee by the builder. Yeah. When the they build the house. Right. Yeah. So if the house is built But the brakes were ago. not just touched, they were kind of jammed on because there was a recognition that although there's someone building a house and it's maybe three hundred thousand dollars in value that didn't exist. The cost to educate and to provide police services and fire services is actually a net loss to the town. So there was a big correction taken at the time to slow that growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was still is. Never, never yeah. had to go over it. So this is this is excellent perspective. Thank you. This is good. Um, so the, the the next question I have uh, for everyone is. Um, we can move right into the one-on-one -on -one laptop update, um, or we can continue discussion. One, one of the purposes of today was to kind of put out onto the table where um, we as either, we being the, the Town Council's Finance Committee, either as individuals or as a group, to kind of give some perspective on where we're thinking going into the joint workshop, which is on the 13th, well, the public hearings next week. The 13th is the joint workshop, and by the way, that's a new phase for me too. So it seems like we're doing a lot of joint uh, workshops and uh, committees. So um, the question I have to everyone is that um, since we're talking about the school budget in general, do we talk about our individual perspectives on the school budget or do we move into the laptop first? What is everyone's pers um I'd like to hear about the laptop. Okay. All right. Come back to that. Excellent. Okay. I too have handouts or paper. They've heard it before, they're used to it. 
Um, the way that I, so if you take the second sheet, this is the spreadsheet here, is actually where I ran all of the numbers. Um, to make it a little more attractive, because you know one of the things that we were thinking was this is a $459 device, and if parents are going to be contributing $100 towards the device, there should be some kind of buy-in that they have. So we are going to give um, seniors the option in their senior year, at the end of their senior year, to purchase the device for a discounted price. That, you'll see in this model, goes down every year, obviously as the device ages. So you'll see in the top, page one, um, we still have the cost of the device is at 459 I did um, bump down the total number of devices that we'll be purchasing to 1,200. We originally had 1,300, 1,350. As I mentioned at the town hall meeting, though, we put that in as an estimate because at the time we knew we'd have roughly 1,000. We weren't quite sure how many students this was two years ago that we started to put this proposal together. So just to be on the safe side, we had 1,100 students. We will have to get the same device for all the staff, so the teachers, the ed techs, the admin staff. The devices that they have now will roll down to the K2, so they won't be decommissioned. They actually will be redeployed. So they'll all have the same device. They'll be working from the same device um, in the classroom and in the back end. So that adds another roughly 1,200 devices on there. You always want to have 5 to 10 percent in hot swaps. And as I mentioned again at the town hall meeting, that the hot swaps are really a device that we just have that's imaged. It's ready to go if a student device fails, if for whatever reason it just stops working or doesn't work correctly, we can swap it out immediately with a device that we have on hand. So we always want to have um, stock on hand. We came up with that 5 to 10 percent number just based on our past experience with the one-to-one -one programs at the middle school, and then again at Wentworth. So we ran numbers over a period of years just to see how many devices do we really swap out regularly. It's been usually between 5 to 10 percent, depending on the time of year. Um, so that's how we came up with this 1,200. We do have a number of the devices on hand that we have been piloting, testing into the classrooms. So we were, that's another way that we were able to bump that number down. Um, you'll see that the licensing, the antivirus, all of that pretty much stays the same. But what I did um, with the ADP, and just a reminder, that's the accidental damage protection. The ADP I restructured because obviously you're going to pay more per device the longer the ADP goes out. Well, if we're estimating that we're going to sell half of the devices to the senior class, then you don't need ADP that's going to go out three and four years. You just need ADP for one year. So I restructured the ADP so that you would have one year, two year, and then three year ADP, and then it would fall into regular cyclical um, replenishment. So that's what you see on page one. Um, page two, you still have laptop bags, spare batteries, spare adapters. I did bump the spare batteries, adapters, et cetera, down just a little bit in year one because the likelihood that we'll have to re be replacing those um, in the first year of service is very low, and there will be a factory warranty on those devices that we can tap into, too, if we have to replace any of those sort of you know, bumper to bumper components. Mm -hmm. We took out charging carts altogether, and that was something that we debated internally just with my team, kind of going back and forth. There is a discipline rubric in the middle school that if you bring your laptop to school and it's not charged, then one of the consequences is you don't have a laptop for the day. The reality of the situation is we do have a couple of charging stations where we'll pop the battery out and we do have a couple of spare batteries that we can swap out. But at the high school level, you're talking 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds, they need to be responsible. They're going to have these um, devices 24-7, so they're just going to have to charge them. We will not be responsible for providing them with um, replacement batteries during the day. We do have a couple of carts um, that we can redeploy. They're not in great shape. At some point, we will have to re replace them, um, which will probably happen at some point during CIP. Um, but for now, we probably can redeploy those carts to the actual tech workrooms where we'll be doing a lot of the maintenance, a lot of the imaging, all that kind of stuff. So we took those out. You'll see in the bottom of page two, I built in the parent contribution. Again, the contribution is $100. So 70 of it is going to go towards the actual cost of the device. 
and uh, 30 of it is going to go, if you flip it over to page 3, towards the maintenance program. We can't not fund the maintenance program, so I have to put something in there. Um, you'll see that there's a lot of different components to the maintenance program, and to actually run in the black every year, we have to fund it at roughly $30 per student. So probably your next question is why are there only 860 students? We base the maintenance program on a, um, uh, on, we base the number, the reduction in the number on the free and reduced rate. So we took out 14% right off the top. So that's how we came up with the 860. Those folks in those families in other phase levels are not expected to pay that maintenance fee if they can't afford it. Obviously, there's paperwork that has to be completed, but we have found on a regular basis that that's roughly the rate that we're going at. So we've reduced that to 860. You can see then the balance of the maintenance fund. I had to really estimate, again, these numbers are sort of based on what we've seen at the middle school. I had to really estimate what we would be spending on an annual basis in maintenance and replacements. Um, but we, we do manage to run in the, re in the, in the black there. So the, the net result of this is on page four. Total funding request, 746625 in year one. And if you flip over to the other pieces packet that I gave you on page one, you'll see where we were before. So when we were at 1,300 devices and um, before we had the parents start to contribute more. Um, so you can see that the revised estimate is 746625 The original estimate was 934 So we have made considerable effort to pair that back. In year two, you can see how we actually are not asking for any money. We'll be rolling money forward. Year three, 3580. So the, the net result there is about a million five over six years as opposed to close to two million. <clears throat> and how did we do that? I just I've run through it already, but the cost revisions are on page two. Increase the family contribution from 25 to 100. We will allow for that senior buyout. So for example, next year, the devices will only be a year old. My daughter will be a senior. I'll pay $100. At the end of the year, I potentially could pay $300 to buy that device. Year two, so the kids who will be juniors next year, when they're seniors, they'll pay $200, $100 junior, $100 senior year. They can, for $200 in their senior year, buy the device. Year three is $100, and every year thereafter, it'll be $100 to purchase the device. When they purchase the device, we will completely wipe it of everything, all of the software, all of the um, data that's on there. What they will receive is a clean device that has a, an operating system on it and then they will have to go out and purchase the bag and the software, whatever they want for their family. Do you have a question? I do have a quick question. So if my daughter's a junior, mm -hmm. I know you said yours is a senior, but if yours is a junior, when she comes back for senior year, she gets a different computer. So basically it's not the same computer that they started with freshman year or whatever year they entered in. Right, so yeah, and the reason for that is, I mean, sometimes they, there's an off chance that they could get the same device. But the reason know. is um, they turn it in. So at the middle school, they turn yep. in the machines. We clean them. It's interesting to see some of these machines <laughs> after a year of use by you know, sixth graders. Um, so we clean them, and then we wipe them of all the data, all the background pictures, all that, you know, everything that you're going to stick on your machine over the year. We wipe it all down, completely re-image the device. We make sure it's free of viruses, et cetera. Um, and then we have to re-inventory it, which means it's assigned out to a particular student so that their login works and everything else. We bag it, we tag it, and then we have to deploy it in the fall. So that happens cyclically every year. I'd just like to point out that this proposal still needs to be vetted through the school board as well. It's a proposal and it's not only right now. Yeah, I encourage Jen to get into some of the detail and there's some policy decisions that the Board of Education will be making, but mm -hmm. really to provide the background as to how the numbers and why the numbers are changing. And that's the point of concern for yep. town. So just, 
I gave you a, another summary again. I think you've received this in the past of what the device actually is that we're looking at. As I mentioned, we have piloted a few at the high school um, in different classes, and we have gotten outstanding feedback from both the students and the staff mm -hmm. using them. Students love them. Um, and then I just sort of summarized again some of the infrastructure pieces that we've put in place already. So things that essentially we don't have to spend money on this year. Um, and primarily these things were deployed in the past because we had to. We were just at a point where some of this, um, the, these devices hit end of life. Um, we had to increase the bandwidth district wide. We had access points that were failing. We didn't have enough access points to provide adequate coverage up at the high school. So we did a lot of that work over the last couple of years. So really in terms of infrastructure, the high school is ready to go for one-to-one. -one. I feel very confident that we will have absolutely no problem rolling out one-to-one -one up there and having everybody be able to connect. Question? So, um, so the, this proposal, Jen, really flips things around on the basis of doing the buyout. And, yeah. and it's a buyout for a device that we purchase at 459, mm -hmm. but is not available for a purchase at that same level. No, if you were to go out to the retail market space, you would have to pay over $700 for this device. We were able to get this cost because this is a known vendor to us. It's a vendor that we work with quite a bit, particularly on the town side, but they do also provide devices for us on the school side. And just out of the sheer volume of business mm. that we do with them, we went straight. We, that was actually one of the questions um, that I thought was a good one in, in, um, that came up at the town hall meeting that I don't think we got to. but. Um, although, I mean, we didn't have an approved project, so we, obviously we couldn't create a formal bid process, but we did go out to six different vendors and resellers, and we, you know, had them um, submit pricing on different models and makes, and really what we found is probably what you could guess, is that the best pricing by far was to go direct to the manufacturer. So both HP and Lenovo, when we went direct to the manufacturer, that's where we got the best pricing. But you can't buy this device on the open market for 459. So just so just so I understand, um, who requested that you go back through and revise the proposal? Um, my supervisors. Okay. Well, and let's say you looks like you've made a, a, a good effort at sharpening the pencil to to try and make it a financially more appropriate or viable proposal. I've, I've thought for a while that uh, uh, because of the nature of the 24-hour 365 use of the thing, <coughs> that all the value that the student gets out of it for personal use that uh, parents <coughs> should pay for it. Uh, and I'm a big supporter of one-on-one -on -one High school. I think it's time has come, and that it's a, an essential element of the way in which students are going to learn. So I fully support the idea of pushing forward this idea. Uh, but this, I think, is good. I I think this, whereas I had thought maybe the parents should just be buying it at the first instance, I think this kind of pay over time is a very appropriate. I like it. I think that's something that the school board's going to have to evaluate with you as well. I think we'll get into a policy issue as well. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's, my own, that's been my own view of, of uh, it's a lot of money. So, um, thank you. By the way, great job the other night. <coughs> oh, thank, you. Mm -hmm. thank you very much. Um, so, whether personally, um, whether it is uh, the original estimate that's been presented, I know has been approved by the school board, or whether it's the new estimate, if that is what comes forward later. Um, I have been in support of the one-on-one -on -one program uh, from day one, so I appreciate everyone's efforts and everyone's dialogue around that. Um, I just want to hope, um, so um, in order for the Town Council's Finance Committee uh, to move forward in a recommendation, we'll need to know what the final policy is from the school board on the proposal so that we can properly um, include that as part of our recommendation to the full council, be and that would have to happen before the 13th. Um, so I know timelines are tight, and 
uh, can be stressed. So um, I just want to say thank you. It is uh, a job well done. I think the only piece that really, um, if I balance out uh, comments that I've received, and I, I'm not sure, um, I think this is a reasonable approach about the increase, personally, and the increase in the investment by the students and their families. Uh, but personally, and, I, and Chris, I've said this to you personally, um, a part of me says if we're going to make this a mandatory part of an educational program, then um, I think that the town should pay, actually pay for that as part of its tax base. Um, uh, because it's, it's very hard to sit there and tell a student um, they have to do this. The big piece I will say, um, th uh, sorry, let me finish that thought. Um, it's a, it's a um, hard thing to say to someone you have to do this, oh, but, and also you have to give us $100. Um, when you compare it to other programs within the school system, whether it's sports, not every kid gets to play varsity sports, so if they have to pay an extra amount, or if they have to, even if it's seventh grade sports, if they have to pay an amount, I think that's reasonable because that's a selective item within the educational program. This is just a little bit different for me, um, but I like the approach that was taken very much um, as part of that, because I think it took into consideration a lot of comments that were made about the contribution by the family. So, I don't know if you... Yeah, I guess I struggle with it of the comments later. I mean, the other thing I've heard overwhelmingly, which I don't know how we deal with it, is a lot of people, there's been a lot of conversation this year about bring the budget forward, bring it to the voters, let them decide. Um, I'm kind of in the core, at least people, a lot of people have an interest in this being a referendum item, so I don't know where that, that fits, but we'll have to take that up at some point and have a conversation. The second piece that I have is just, um, I'm thinking about the total budget, I am concerned about, and this just circles back, at, at the 9.7% increase, that's still a big chunk. I think that's going to be a communication challenge for our constituency, and how do we talk about that? And I just, the only piece of this for me is the timing, is it this year or next year? So that's, that's sort of my thought. And I agree. I just think that if we wait until next year, it's not going to be any better. Go up more. It is not going to be any no, better in the outlook. So no, but I guess I guess what I'm looking at, the yeah. way I look at it, is what we're asking. You know, if you look, going back to these sheets that were shared since 2011, on that on the 20-year history you gave us, you know, since 2011, you know, Scarborough has had an increase of 16.3 percent versus the average cohort of 11.4 and the state average of 9.1. So we are, we're catching up, but it is something taxpayers absorb. The only reason I'm thinking about timing is we're asking taxpayers to absorb the million dollar shortfall in funding we know about, and we're asking them for the increased debt service. So that's a lot, you know, get right out of the gate that you can't control. Right, but Peter, to the point, and we brought this up in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, the, the, the public hearing as well. That money that we're devoting to one-to-one -one computing yeah. would be in the CIP budget as a tech refresh no matter what. It's actually reduced this year compared to other years in terms of our overall CIP request. So it's not like we're creating a new million dollar need. We're repurposing the million dollars that we were, or the $800,000 that we would have invested in tech refresh <coughs> in another facility to accommodate that. So I think that's something that we need to keep in perspective as well. Can I make one other point too, just on behalf of the one-to-one -one program, just from what my staff went through this year with online testing, which is now mandated by the state. Right. Trying to rotate such a large number of kids through three technology labs with 25 desktops each was almost an insurmountable task. It, it took weeks and weeks and weeks. And you know, if you had one failure of one desktop, you were kind of doomed from the get-go. So whereas the other schools, which we're still in process of testing, but we completed the middle school, have one-to-one -one computing, it just went very easy, it was very quick, it took two weeks. And that technology doesn't even uh, discuss the impact on class time and the disruption to schedules and class schedules that were weeks at the high school rotating different students through adjusting schedules because they're not in class while they're testing. So, um, well, and um, the other thing is there are many classes that take place in the tech labs right. that need the technology in the tech labs and when they're bumped out for weeks and weeks and weeks by the mandatory online testing, those kids have no devices. So Chris made the point I was going to oh, okay. that the oh, high school was, time was coming up to the, to the point of 
timing. That's why it's coming forward this year. Mm. Uh, I just want to mention, actually, a thought, because actually was reading some uh, information on what's going on in Augusta. You know, if anything, even though we're kind of late to the game, because I think it was mentioned we're only one of three school districts that aren't one-to-one uh, -one at the high school in our cohort, um, there's actually two bills before the legislature, one by both parties, but they're fairly similar, that deals with virtual education mm -hmm. and being able to uh, provide the same services at the same level so that we remain competitive, not only globally, but competitive at the very least locally, um, I think that this is probably one of the most significant advancements for the school system. And it's really five years late, because the last time we discussed this was my last year on the council five years ago. Mm -hmm. And it got killed. Not only that, but if you were to put it out to a referendum, are people going to have the knowledge we have here? Two years, mm. Jen, working on this to try to figure this out. Will they go to the polls with any knowledge about a decision other than kind of on it? No, I don't think the high school needs. I don't have any kids, and I'm not giving giving them a computer. Mm. So that's not informed piece. That's you know that's why we, that's why we sit. That's why we we're here to be able to analyze all this stuff and and discuss it. Yeah. Anything else on 101? Christine? No? Chris? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Very good job. I'm not surprised. Um, really, the, the last item, um, and um, so um, some of us on the school, on the school board, on the town council said, that uh, we kind of wanted to really kind of put up on, out onto the table, um, maybe where we're kind of uh, envisioning where we're going to go move forward through the, the process. The question I have to my fellow counselors is that given such fresh information about, particularly about 101, and even the historical trends that were prevented, to, you know, do we really want to have that conversation now? Do we want to sit on it and wait until the public hearing and the workshop? How do you? I could just How do you guys want to say that I do have some other bits here that might yeah. be of use to digest. I mean, some of yeah. these things are things that you already know about. Some of them are background pieces of information. I, I guess one of, one of the goals that I, I, I personally had with bringing a group like this together is that we could identify questions and address them uh, before we get to the last minute type of stuff, which we've done in the past. So, I mean, if there are recurrent lingering questions right now, I'd like to get them out there and get them addressed and, and to the satisfaction that they get resolved. Um, I'd rather do that sooner than later and not wait until the last minute again this year. Um, I'm not trying to pressure anybody to make decisions now, but if there are lingering questions and concerns, I, I, I think we need to get those on the table and have an opportunity to, to discuss what those might be. So. Well, I, I did express the concern I had about the one-on-one -on -one computing that I would have liked to have seen the parents pick it up, but the proposal that was made does exactly what I was thinking ought to be done in a different way, but in an effective way, and I think as a, as a matter of should we do it, I absolutely think we should do it. So that, that question has been answered for me. Uh, I think uh, I had questions about uh, uh, what was uh, what was behind the uh, special ed increases, what was behind the charter school increases, because it looks like we've gotten uh, some significant impacts as a result. So we didn't really get a chance to talk about that. We just ran out of time last time. I do have a handout, I don't mean to interrupt no, you, but I, I do have a handout about charter schools because that was something that Tom and I had talked about that was sort of floating out there. So that will be a, a, just a sort of summary of how we arrived at the numbers we did. We haven't really addressed uh, special ed outside of the conversations that we had in the budget workshop, um, but it's something that we can certainly provide you with. Um, I don't know if this is the forum or if this is things that we need to follow up on. Mm -hmm. Either, because a lot of times you can provide a much more thoughtful response by you know, doing a little bit of an analysis. So, so let me ask you this: if if we if we don't adopt the one-to-one -one proposal as it stands now, increasing that fee to 100 for 
very similar. I'm sure many of the board members will have similar concerns to what Sean is, is expressing. I, I'm certainly one of them. Yeah. Um, if it's a requirement for education, I think that is something that should be part of our budget. Um, I, I don't have a problem with parking fees and sports fees. and I, I may not like them personally as a parent, but those are extracurricular activities. So I, I, my concern is going to be that where we approach it from a policy decision of saying we don't think it's appropriate to charge more than the insurance fees mm -hmm. like we charge at the middle school. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to know if that's going to be the deciding factor to move the, the, the plan forward or whether that's a, is that something that would cause you to say I, I, I really can't support this proposal. Right, yeah, that, would, that would be my view. You, would, you could not support that if we, right. if we adjusted it. Yeah. Okay. And I, I liked what was done because I think it more fairly balances the circumstances that are presented, which is a huge cost, uh, versus uh, a uh, piece of equipment that the students take home with them, enjoy, benefit from, uh, and are required my, to have. Honestly, my daughter, we bought her a computer. I mean, so if you're saying that my daughter's using her school laptop for any kind of enjoyment purposes, that's not the case. She strictly uses it as an educational tool. But see, that's that's just anecdotal. And no, I know. Well, no, I no that she's bought her her child a and computer. And I know a, a lot of that's that anecdotal. Have, but right. that's a single incident. It, please, yeah. please, let me finish. There are lots of people who have not done that and who will benefit from the or will have one, but it's going to not be as new and as good. And they'll let that one go by or they'll give it to a, a, a sibling. Or, so there's, there's, you're giving a person full rights to the computer. That's different. My older daughter, the same thing. She left high school. She, she came out of eighth grade, had a device, left eighth grade, and she says, how am I supposed to be able to do all of these things without a tool? So we bought her a tool going into freshman year of high school, and she is still, right now, she's a freshman in college, wrapping up her first year, and she still has the same tool. So I'm not saying that you'd go out and get a new computer every year or such, but to have the device to be able to use for the purposes of the education was important to us, for her to do her research and do her work and papers and whatever it might be. And here's my challenge from a policy standpoint, okay? Um, once we ask them to invest, they have ownership. Okay? We've got policies in place that restrict them from certain use, certain personal uses on the laptop because it's school property. Mm -hmm. Once we give them ownership and once, we, once they invest in that and they feel like it's part of their rights, mm -hmm. we could run into some potential policy concerns with that. How do we enforce those, those issues of what's allowed on the computer and what's not allowed on the computer? Because once you ask somebody to invest in that and own a portion of it, we really, from a, a policy standpoint, I'm not sure how we can control that. But uh, here's the issue, if I could maybe cut through it. I think uniquely this has future costs. Most other CIP items, which this is, I mean, the first decision this finance committee needs to make, the most important one is how much to allocate your capital budget uh -huh. next year. Mm -hmm. But this has future costs, and once, once we get down this road, we're not reversing that trend. So I think this is uniquely different in that what I hear Councilor Donovan talking about is a pretty important financial feature in the out years. And yeah, I, I don't think we appreciate all the policy implications of that, but I think this is unique in that respect. And that's why we may want to assert our opinions beyond fiscal year 16. And noted and understood. I just, when we look at it from a board perspective, we have to evaluate the policy implications, not just the financial impact. And there are going to be some complications associated with that, I believe. So if that's going to hold the, if that's going to hold the proposal up, and then uh, we have to weigh how we're going to do that as a board. Is that's there our decision. That your if there are policy implications yeah. that you're not prepared to go with, there are other choices. You find another device. You, you, mm -hmm. you, you size it to the budget you have. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to go down, I've already shared my opinion. My stronger preference is to go with a new proposal. I think it's a fair balance, but I do understand and fully, in my previous position, it opens up a, when you have buy-in from the user, regardless of whether they are a town employee or whether they're a student, there's issues of privacy, there's issue of 
um, use and appropriateness and all kinds of things that you have to deal with. Not only, and you're not really dealing with the student, you're dealing with the parents. Mm -hmm. And um, that situation, which can be a very different scenario, it's not as easy as dealing with just the student. So, but I trust you guys to make that decision. My preference is to go with the second one, but I do support the first. I did want to say one thing. I am also looking at the long range impact and that is this is really a $300,000 investment over the next three years because it's going to be financed appropriately. So, um, and actually over the rest of the, you know, whatever the schedule is. So um, that has to be taken into consideration when we start planning for next year um, because it does impact the long range plan. So. I, th I think uh, just in terms of the proposal, um, I know that Tom was receiving feedback from counselors who basically asked, is there some, are there some other options? And that was really, Jen does such a good job in terms of, you know, putting numbers together and sort of revising everything. This essentially was, was a proposal in response to, is there an opportunity to in institute a buyout program where we then could look at um, some sort of calibrated um, uh, increase as we go through the, the, uh, the phases in the schools in terms of what the parents are, are paying. So this was, this was that option or that proposal. I, I think that, um, as Chris said, they're hearing it at the same time that you are. And, and Jen is prepare, you know, has prepared it and has put it out as though this is the, the new proposal or the, or the new uh, revision. Um, this is how it could be revised in the event that it were to be a buyout program and that um, based on her expertise, she was saying that there would be a certain amount that parents would pay and essentially then kids could actually also walk away with the device, um, which would be valued much higher than what we pay for it um, and having, having made a contribution along the way. I, I can almost see a good compromise, and again, just throwing this out there to see what you think. Uh, where we keep the we keep the annual cost to the cost of insurance, but then the buyout program at the end gives the student the option to buy the computer at a discounted rate. Instead of funding that over the three years, you fund that with one shot, and whatever comes from those sales gets rolled back into the fund. That way, we don't have issues with privacy policy things like that. So, but we do get some revenue on the other side by choice if the student wants to buy that laptop. The other two items I wanted to mention was there's this dichotomy right now, and that is that we've talked a lot about level services on the town side, as well as on the school side. So um, for me, there's a balance because there's about $335,000 in new needs or new investments for you. However, the town council has also added, or at least the finance committee has added a smaller portion of new investments. Personally, I think it needs to be higher. I'm talking about the fire, uh, the fire department piece. Um, the question, the, the, the comment I want to make to my fellow counselors, as well as one sitting in the audience, is that if we're going to hold the school department to level services, then it is only fair that the town holds itself to level services, um, because I don't think that you can argue out of both sides of, of our mouth or my mouth. Um, so I want to keep that in mind. The last piece that I'm looking at is really the only the only thing I'm looking at is really the use of fund balance, and and what is the strategy around that because. You know, I did, when we looked at the budget, there was an original proposal by the Leadership Council to use an additional 300000 I think it was. So I, I, I'm going to do a little bit more research before the workshop, but if there's an opportunity to use that fund and use those monies this year, I think it's a better approach. Um, to bring down the 330000 um, To add an additional 300. Um, I'm balancing and rounding numbers. So yeah. whether it's 335 or whether it's 300, it's really about fund balance policy. Um, and if you're doing that and offsetting it with, you know, I mean, we found some additional revenues to offset ours, so if we can do the same, I think that there's a balanced argument. Um, but it's also about fund balance, and I, personally, I think that the fund balance in the school department should be reused or whatever is captured in the previous year, just carried over to the next year, because it's, it was part of the budget, so. I, I mean, Kate obviously can speak to that. I think we hit the fund balance pretty hard last year. I agree. I agree. And, and, you know, we're trying to follow sound okay. accounting practices as, as the town is for a certain reserve. Um, well, they, just, and, yeah, and, and, and I don't know how much to, you know, again, whether we start yeah. building now or later or how sure. we do that, you know. So the irony when I was taking notes from the audit, the audit um, committee or the audit uh, presentation, 
it was really interesting to hear because the way the auditor worded his statements around fund balance was that there's a ceiling in which the school department can have fund balance, mm -hmm. but there is a floor for the town council. Mm -hmm. is, that, exactly. is that about right? Exactly. So um, I'm just saying is that um, we should be closer to a floor mm -hmm. than it is to a ceiling for the school department. So. Well, and the, the complication in all of that is that the town's fund balance is the school fund balance. Right. Where Part of it, it, yeah. it, it, it's, you know, there's, there's a large portion of the town fund balance that relies on what's going on in the school. So, um, and I do want you to know that I'm looking at the town's fund balance because that's part of the conversation that we were supposed to have as well. So it's the same strategy I'm applying to both sides. One yeah. of the charts I have with me is basically just a, a history of the use of fund balance on the school side. And it, it'll it show you that you know, we, we kind of hit it hard in those down years when, you know, call it rainy day or call it whatever you like. I mean, it, it was raining hard and so we applied a great deal of fund balance to our budget and we did the same thing last year because yes. we had an excess there. Um, but now we're down in, in the range where we begin to feel a little bit less comfortable. Um, do you, but, you, know, do you want this, this packet that Kate has prepared? Well, we to have to to it. it basically has the, um, the update in terms of um, Thank the you. expenditures, et cetera, the fund balance piece that she's referencing, <coughs> information uh, related to um, full-time equivalent uh, positions, uh, FY14, 15, and what's proposed, and also charter schools. Great. So there's, there's four important pieces so, for you. Um, great, Thank you. Uh, great information. I just wanted you to be, um, if you could think about that so it's not a surprise is the big part, but um, I just realized it's 8.20, so um, at least uh, what you, you're kind of like the last. Yeah, and, and I guess I'm kind of back at sort of the macro level. You know, if we look at at least the data that's in front of us tonight, where we're sitting with the numbers that are in front of us is still a, a tax rate increase of 7.3% combined between, you know, municipal and schools. The municipal is 1.7, the schools is 10%. I still struggle a little bit with a 10% increase in the environment that we have and just wondering what some of the trade-offs might be that we can at least think about. I still think I, everything I've heard from my constituency base, 7% is going to be a tough number. Um, so, you know, so, so I'm curious about what are some of the trade-off conversations we can have to do anything to soften them. And Sean mentioned using some reserves, but a 10% increase given this environment, I think, is, is tough. And I just like the, like the voters will decide at the end of the day, but I right. think they need to know what those trade-off conversations are. Right. I just think from what I've heard, um, I think it's, it's going to be tough. So I, I think sharpening our pencil wherever we can, we're going to need to do to deliver something. I think I, I can, I'm going to speak for myself, uh, not for the whole board. I know we've sharpened it pretty mm -hmm. tight now, and we put it in front of you with the intention that the 300000 is really what we're looking at for new investments, if you will, to keep things moving along. So while I can appreciate the, 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 the uncomfortableness with that number, I think what we're really talking about is if we do make reductions, we're going to have to look at reductions in core services somewhere, somehow, whatever those may be. I'd rather not predict those now because, because I don't want to be in a position, especially when it comes to personnel, we have legal obligations for notification and things like that. So I don't want to, I don't want to put us in a position where we've got people on pins and needles, as it were. In, in, and again, speaking for myself personally, I think if we agree that the what's in the budget is real and it's it's understandable, we may not like it, but we understand it. Let let the, the town. This is we're in a unique position with the school budget, where the voters get input. And if if the resolution that the town comes back with is that the budget is not approved, then we have that very candid discussion of where do we go from here and how do we how do we get it into a more man, you know what we would consider or what you would consider a more manageable manageable piece because I mean really I think if as long as you as long as you can understand and 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 relate and, and agree to where the where the increases are coming from and why they're coming from there. Um, I, I, I and I as I've said before, I'd welcome any advice on where you think we can reduce costs and, and we can discuss what that impact would be. 
on an individual basis, on a, on a specific line item, if you will, or something like that. But, yeah, I mean, we've gone through and flushed this budget through a long process. So I, I guess I guess um, I, I can I, I understand the position I really do. I just I'm, I'm hesitant to go through and and make um, dramatic impacts and adjustments before we have the opportunity to hear what the town wants us to do. If that makes sense. It, yeah, that makes sense. And so I guess I'll defer to Sean on. Sure. Is that is that a workshop? Is that a format? Is is yeah, yeah, so given where we are, how? Yeah, so there are next steps. Um, there is, um, in my head, there's the next step that we kind of need to talk about. Um, and there's a couple of iterations in between that stop us. Uh, of course, we have the public hearing on um, Wednesday, and then we have our workshop on the 13th. Um, so um, procedurally, from the, from the Finance Committee, we don't talk, we being the Town Council, do not talk about line items. So I appreciate both of you kind of keeping it in the context that if you want to share, um, some recommendations that that should be something that's really not part of our committee discussion because uh, I wouldn't want to violate state law or the intent of the charter because that's the school board's purpose. Um, so um, I do think that at some point we need um, we need to reconvene the town council's mm -hmm. funds to be able to have a final discussion um, on setting that bottom line for the school board and, and approving it as a recommendation and it should be a recommendation before, for me, I would like to see it obviously a recommendation before the 13th so that it is out there and available for everyone at that workshop so that we know where the baseline is so we can be told and either um, smacked around by the other four members of the town council and said that we did it wrong or we find consensus and move forward. Um, after that though, I think that, um, I just lost total train of thought. I am, so tired. I'm not what is the uh, what is the agenda for the 13th? I don't know because that's a joint workshop between the town council and the school board. So it's it's a it's a workshop that is chaired by the chair chairwoman. Oh, okay, okay. Chairwoman it's not a finance Jessica, committee. No. It's not a joint no. meeting of the finance committee. We did no. last year. Oh, uh, it might have been board. Yeah, the full, the full body got together, and I found it to be very helpful. I, I don't cover the we did the year prior to that, but it was just an opportunity to do kind of what we're doing here, but with the full two full governing bodies, and you know, running through questions, trying to figure out if there were stumbling blocks. And the, the biggest difference this year, that kind of um, I don't want to say it interferes, but it kind of muddies it a little bit, is the fact that we have this joint workshop. Right these joint sessions here. Mm -hmm. We never had that before, so that was the purpose of the workshop. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be interesting. I'll, I'm going to have a conversation with Jessica to see how we can help her run that, because we'll have a recommendation out of our committee. I don't know if she wants to use that as the baseline or what was approved at the first reading. Um, that's her prerogative as chairwoman, so I'm going to respect that. But mm -hmm. uh, we'll at least be able to advise her what I, the goal is that we'll advise her what this finance committee's recommendation is. And, I, and our, my hope would be that we could use that as a forum to discuss concerns and questions. And, yeah, and if there are if there are follow up things, or you know, if it's, whether it's the one to one discussion or how we're mm -hmm. gonna how we're gonna structure that, and what's the what are the implications of making the decisions that we're making? Today. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so um, if everyone is okay, we're gonna take off the table tonight the discussion on the municipal budget as well as on the fund balance. It is getting to be 8:30. Um, and then um, what I'll do is I'll do a survey with you folks later to, to, try and to schedule, to schedule, to schedule when our next meeting should be. Good. Is it something between now and the 13th? Yes, um, preferably before the 12th. I don't want to really have a meeting on the 13th. Um, Tom, I, I did want to ask if you came prepared with any information regarding the fund balance. We can take that home as homework or uh, as information. Okay. And I'll just yeah. For your reference, it's uh, fairly deep in the packet. Okay. Uh, the policy is here. The quick word is, uh, and this does not account for the potential use of fund balance in the current year, which there will be some, um, but we've identified $224,000 in excess of your policy. For, for municipal? Available for use. 224. If you wish, if you wish to use it. I don't want to put Kate on the spot, but... Um, Let's do it. <laughs> 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 if you suggest anything, there's likely to be some of the currently budgeted fund balance in FY15 not fully expended. So I don't
don't expect uh, we'll be dipping below the policy by virtue of that fact, and that's why I offer up 225 as a comfortable number that's available without violating the policy. And that would be added to the 200,000 that the school presently has in its proposal. It takes into account that 200,000. So it would be 200 it's plus 225. Right. Because the bond on the. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's so really not fund balance. I think yeah. that's oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Well, that's yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's yeah. you have 200 yeah. fund balance, two, uh, 250 uh, uh, went 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 for a total of 450. Correct. Mm -hmm. And so and but, but well, what Tom's yeah. identifying is 225 of additional funds. Right. I just want to be clear the 250 for the Wentworth bond proceeds are not technically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not no, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. It has been kind of I just want everyone yeah. to know that so what we're talking about is based on what Tom has identified yeah. an additional two hundred twenty five thousand yeah. across both yeah. municipal and schools. It would I think however would technically show on our side of the budget. We have no budgeted to right, right, right. at this point. Okay, I'll have my questions for that page later. Um so um, what I do want to kind of, um, there's no one, and well actually there is someone still here, a couple of people actually, I'm sorry I didn't see you over there. Um, uh, we do have, um, if everyone is okay, we're going to move to public comments, and so if there's anybody that would like to speak, you're welcome to speak. Not seeing any? Oh, sure. Kate. If you'd like, you can just sit right here because uh, it's late. In that one you handed out. The last one changes a little bit in debt service. It puts the debt service cost up and the, um, there's an offsetting um, fund premium, debt service premium at the bottom. So it's, it's a very minimal change, but it is something that came to light and it'll be part we of the recommendation. Oh, I see it. it as well. 336 went up to 341. Just, just a smidge. If you look at the second sheet, you'll see the whole change from Okay. Station. No, I just wanted to understand it. Thank you. Just questions around the one-to-one -one program. Yes, uh, we are being televised, oh. so if you can mention a name and address. Larry Hartwell, Thank 9 Puritan you. Drive, Scarborough. I have a question about the one-to-one -one program. Uh, first of all, for the, the counselors here, do you access um, town records and town information from outside the, the, the uh, building here, um, off-site? I'll answer at least uh, my limited. Um, through SharePoint, we have access to the, whatever the host server is that um, houses the agendas, the supporting documentation, meeting minutes, and items like that, but it does not have access to data files or data systems or any, anything other than simply whatever is hosted on that for areas. And I ask the same question on this side of the table here as far as information from the school when you're outside of the, the office area here, can you access? Some of us have limited access to, um, to our basically to our desktop that we're okay. I just get emails. Yeah, board members just have access to yeah. the same thing that comes here the share okay. point that has agenda information and, and stuff to do the business with. Okay. Well over at the library, um, and we have a great li town library here, you can access a wealth of information from around the world on a PC, uh, you know, a notebook, a tablet, a smartphone. Mm -hmm. um, businesses like TD Bank, Hannaford, they have thousands of computers around the country. So what I'm saying is, and they don't have, you know, the same unique model in, in every location on these systems. So they're able to access using all types of devices, all types of models. So my question is, instead of having computers for the, the kids, is, or why, does it, why do they have to have their own computers? Why can't, if half the families have notebook computers, why can't they access like a central server? The kids that don't have them in the high school, we buy for them. Uh, your, your plan of possibly selling them to them, we could do, if they're four or $500, then $100 a year or $125 a year. Then we get away from the policy issues of you know, privacy and how they use the computers because the ones that they have, they're bringing from home, have, you know, they can do whatever they want on those. And the children that don't have their own, they're going to buy it over the four years. So we say they own them and they're going to be on a four-year payment plan. There's, there's a, um, and I, and I, I'm, I'm sorry to ask this question yeah. because it was probably answered long ago in 
right. in the discussion. And the person who could give you the yes. most succinct and, um, and accurate answer is, uh, has left the room. Yes, uh, but I've heard the explanation a number of times. First off, I would direct you to the proposal uh, that is currently on the, on the, um, the website um, and that you might want to take a look at that because it does, um, it does basically address the fact that the BYOD, which is bring your own device, which is essentially what you're referencing, yes. Um, was fully explored, and um, and that was not the most economical way to move, particularly because um, the the educational tool that the uh, laptop is in the classroom really depends on everyone having access um, to not only um, what they need to in terms of the the what the teacher has planned, but as well um, some specialized uh, software that we also need to have access to so that the, um, the orchestration of the use of that tool in a classroom really does require that they are working from the same device. Okay. And, and again, you might get a better explanation yeah. in terms of reading the, the piece that was done around the, ex uh, around the, uh, the proposal. Okay. In order to do a BYOD as well, there's an, an additional level of interface that's required, which is also very costly. So it's not only not that effective, but, but it is costly. There's a, there is some issues too, I think, with connectivity. So if, if you have a student, let's say, who's out in West Scarborough, I'm not sure what the, what the internet connections are, like up there, I assume everything's pretty good, but I don't know for sure. Um, with, a, with a laptop device, they can work off the hard drive at home doing their homework. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that constant connection. And when we looked at the Chromebooks or the internet user interfaces, it had to always be that internet connection there some way, somehow. So if, the, if, if, if students don't have broadband or internet at home, they would be basically only able to do their homework or do their schoolwork while they're in school or in a another area. So Valid, valid point. Yeah, yeah. So, so part of that, that was part of it. It wasn't the only reason, but that was one of the other factors that helped them. You, um, you heard some talk about testing as well, and the testing piece is, is a very difficult thing to orchestrate, and uh, trying to do that with multiple devices. This is, a lot of kids have this, but this is really not an acceptable device to do testing or agree. many, many other things. I, would agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think that um, Ms. Lim actually shared at the forum that it was an additional 500 or $600,000 for that. To build so the, the virtual interface. To, to do the interface piece alone, so um, it is pretty, pretty large. It's, it is possible when we explored it, but from, from a cost standpoint, I think Jen was, was pretty confident that the cost savings of going with a, 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 a purchase device and having that uniformity through the whole district would end up actually saving money, more money than it would having to deal with all the different forms of connectivity and different software issues and things like that, licensing issues and all that other stuff. That well, the, the point of not being able to use it off school grounds, yeah. that, that's real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, and you, you asked some important questions. Um, those are the same kind of questions that we've been asking for two years. So it's been lengthy, lengthy uh, discussions and evaluations, analysis, and, um, you know, searching for other school districts, other places, where have they tried, what, have they done that, you know, and, and gathering all that information. So, you know, I think it was, a, what was it, a February 22nd uh, January. meeting that Jen did that? Was it a January meeting or a February? Uh, does a white paper that's out there cover all this? There's a paper that's on their website, I think, that yeah. might be useful. It has a reference. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. Any Thank other you. questions, sir? Uh, no, I will just, uh, just uh, allude back to my comments I made last week about the town's budget committee yeah. and their what I is their responsibility. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not seeing any other public comments. Um, I, I just wanted to share a couple of personal comments and uh, kind of go around really quickly. Uh, first, I, I really want to say thank you about the forum. Um, I think it's probably one of the most successful um, um, objectives that we um, implemented as part of this year, as part of this new structure. Uh, Chris, thank you very much. George, thank you. Tom, you did a great job. Uh, Joanne did a great, everyone, Kevin, too. Kevin, was, awesome. Kevin was very good, Ke yeah, um, especially Kevin, um, as well as Karen Martin. 
Uh, Kevin Freeman was our moderator. So I just want to say thank you. I think and I hope that if one thing happens out of this is that whoever is chair of our committees, respective committees, continue this joint workshop approach as well as continue this uh, public forum that we had on the budget because um, it was very useful. It was challenging when the personal questions were asked, but uh, you should have seen the emails afterwards. Um, but uh, thick skin can uh, drive away some of the most evil people. Um, so with that in mind, I also wanted to mention that um, we do need, um, so we're not meeting again before, um, actually we're not meeting again ever, technically, um, but we should have at least an opportunity to talk about our next steps as two committees. Uh, one thing is, and to think about that over the next couple of weeks, because obviously with the budgets and your own schedules and everything, um, we may not be able to have one, but I would really like to talk about having some type of um, uh, in project management, you know, it's lessons learned, uh, kind of a scenario. Mm -hmm. So um, whether we have that conversation, um, I would hope that it also includes maybe a survey of all the participants, everyone. Um, you know, handled anonymously so that we can also then have some fair and open comments, uh, polite and respectful and maybe humorous following the norms that we all adopted. Um, but I think that um, that could be, you know, put together for us and shared so that we can then identify what do we do next um, and how do we uh, make this better. Uh, and then also particularly what is the next step because our relationship really doesn't end after the budget, budget session. It's about being informed all the way through the process. So. If we could all think about that and where we should go with that, um, we can then bring that up. Well, the question is, do we do we want to, you know, after the budget process is completed, do we want to reconvene again and have another joint session where we talk about that and, you know, to sort of see, yeah, yeah, see just, what we yeah. thought was yeah. successful. Yep. I thought the format of the forum was very successful, very efficient, uh, an ability to get through a lot of questions. <coughs> Uh, collating questions that were of a substantially similar nature. Yep. I thought it was very helpful getting most of the questions uh, asked about people who really had a concerned interest asked up front so that the answers could be thoughtful and, and the right people could be put there. I thought it, there was more educating that went on. Uh, I think this materials that we were given tonight are particularly helpful because I think you need to be able to understand the whole picture of what has been the historical norm uh, here and there's been a, and this is going to be very helpful. I think it will advance the discussion next year tremendously because I think I feel like I'm in a different place than I was a year ago uh, in terms of what's fair and appropriate uh, when you try and balance the interests of all concerned. And, and I just want to mention while uh, Chris and I may have sat down and really kind of gave, uh, did a high level of what we saw for the forum. Really want to give credit to George and Tom for organizing it and really doing the legs work on this because um, it was, I think that um, the presentation and the flow was absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. So I appreciate everything that you guys have done. Just the final piece of that, I want to report that uh, as of now, we do have all the written responses. Um, interestingly enough, in the end, uh, the questions were almost equal. 37 to the school, 38 to the town. And a number of ours were process related. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so yeah. that's posted on the school website, and we'll have it on the town website first thing in the morning. I think, um, uh, Chris, to answer your question, would I be, if you talked about what I'd be interested in is whether kind of an offshoot of this, and we still, t I think this forum was really well done, but I think it really did highlight that there's a real educational opportunity, and we had talked about is there a way the groups could get together to create fact sheets or something right. that tells the story in a, a fair narrative that everybody can agree to, so the facts the facts. Right. I think that would be a really useful process before this whole process starts again, just here's the information, here's the information we think is important for people to know. So wherever that lives, I don't know if it lives in this group or some communications group, but that's been on the agenda for a while. I just think that would be a really good thing to move forward. Great. And, and I, um, I just realized um, on the thought around the survey and getting people's opinion, I do, unless someone objects, I really think that we need to include our colleagues um, who aren't here, so the other four members of the council as well as the other four members of the school board, because they are um, active participants um, on the outside looking in, and I think that their perceptions and their uh, understanding of our work is really um, important to understand if we've done what they wanted us to do as well. So, so with that, um, any, anything from 
you no, I, I, uh, I, if this is the last time we get together before the, before the proverbial uh, D-Day, then I... Uh, do you need tissues? I, will, I, will, I may. I may. Um, I do... Uh, yes, thanks. I always, always count on the back. Um, I do appreciate everybody um, putting the effort into this and, and moving this process forward. It's been, uh, it's been a while, I think, coming. And I think um, ultimately, as Sean and I have talked, we want to try and develop a framework that that moves beyond people and, and is a good, a good structure for the town to, to kind of do business moving forward. So regardless of who's sitting in our seats, um, I mean, obviously they, they have the, the, the most reasonable chance of continuity, um, but it's good to have, it's good, to have a, a good framework in place, I think. And so I appreciate everybody's patience and time, and, and uh, um, I'm looking forward to a final budget season, yeah. a, a, a very less contentious one. You know, I wanted to mention something that you and I had talked about, and actually I think it was you and I, George and Tom, and I think that this is um, hopefully the outcome that will come hopefully by next year, is that we have to get to a point in this town in which we're no longer just looking at the numbers, and we have to think about uh, strategic value and what is our value mission for the community and really get the buy-in, and that's where the education comes in around. And so it's really, we've gotten through the numbers, we've gotten through it, and while there's always going to be challenges, when are we going to have the value conversation? And I think that this has been a nice uh, framework for that. So this is excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything? No, no, I, mm -hmm. no I think you pretty much said it all. Yeah. That's, a, that's tough to get at, the concept of, of the value mm -hmm. added. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's one, well, we have answered or made an effort to answer a lot of these questions. That's one that I've kind of grappled with. And, and, and I think intuitively feel there's tremendous value, value, but I don't know how to really quantify it or have it be, uh, make the argument for exactly how it shows it. And, and if we can't figure that out, and we're, all, we're living it, uh, I can imagine how difficult it is yeah. for people on the outside of the process to try and grasp it yeah. as well. So. Well, it's 8.45, unless anyone objects, uh, I hear a unanimous vote yeah. for adjournment. <laughs> so moved. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor, yay.